Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the sixth tonight as we worship together from our downtown cathedral. Pastor Terry has a powerful message for us tonight, and we are excited to receive God's word together in just a little bit. Now's a great time to eliminate distractions, focus our attention on Jesus. Yeah. I believe God is going to do something great in our time together. Yeah. So let's lean in with faith and expectation as we go into a time of worship. We love you, church. Come on, wherever you are, we're gonna declare the name of Jesus over our circumstance. Together, we're gonna worship and declare his great name. Come on. Come on, together we sing. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Amen. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. Don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up I don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you Yes, he is. Take courage, hold on, be strong
With your spirit, come on, mark these walls with your peace as we gather two or three. Wow. Can we just thank our worship team today, yeah, church? Come on. come on, wherever you are, maybe post a hand clap emoji in the chat. Thank you, team, for always leading us into the yeah, presence man. of God. It is in God's presence that we find our hope, we find our help, we find our life and healing. And so today, church, as we pray together, let's remind ourselves of all He has done yeah. and all He is going to do right. through His promises to us. And let's stir our faith to believe for miracles in our lives, in our homes, and in our communities. Yeah. Very good. Hey, we're celebrating some great wins with you today. I've got some praise reports here. Someone's thanking God because they have been drug-free for five Come years. On. That amazing. is an amazing win. Someone is thanking God for a new baby this week. Beautiful. Someone's thankful for a job and someone is thanking God because they're starting to get their hearing coming back in their ear. Yeah. These are reasons to celebrate today. So come on, church, let your faith rise in this moment to believe for God's goodness in every area of our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we worship you today. We say, come, yes. bring your presence yes. into our midst. And we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, yes. and his sacrifice on the cross so that we could live with purpose, we could live with hope, and we could look forward to a future that you have blessed and given us promise towards. Today, Jesus. Lord, we bring our needs before yes, you, God. Lord. We're praying for physical thank healing you, for those who need it, Lord. We're praying yes, for Lord. eradication of the coronavirus yes, in, in our name. community and in our right. world. Lord, we're praying for justice and for yes. healing and for unity to yes, be the God. sound of our hearts and yes. the sound of our communities thank in you. this day that we're in. Father, we thank, thank, you. thank you that your hand is upon everything yeah. in this season. And Jesus, we declare your kingship yes, and your glory yes, in Lord. our generation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we're so glad to be with everyone, and we would love to hear from you on the chats this evening. You can send through your favorite animal emoji, maybe lyric from the last song, Come on. say hi to a new friend, or even drop in a solid amen. Amen. As a pastoral team, we know how powerfully your life can go forward, living and giving in community. And hey, we'd love to help you connect into a small group in your neighborhood or connect you with an opportunity to serve in our city care work or maybe even on one of our service teams when we regather on site soon. Yeah. So simply text the number on your screen or click the link on your screen or in the chat there and the team will follow up with you shortly. Yeah. Well, let's take a moment to prepare our giving this evening. Let's prepare our ties, let's prepare our offerings, and let's prepare our hearts. Come on. God loves a cheerful giver, and I've found that joy flows from a place of gratitude. When we take a moment to pause and genuinely thank God, what He's done for us, Come on. the outflow of it is an authentic sense of joy. Hey, we didn't deserve His good hand on our lives, but He placed it there anyway because that's who He is. Yeah. He's our good, good Father. He knows exactly what we need. Hey, will you pray with me and let's thank him together. Lord, thank you for your good hand upon our lives. Thank you that tonight, Lord, we have something in our hand to give in worship and in response back to you. Thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for giving us what we didn't deserve. And thank you for the gift of salvation that works its way through every aspect of our lives when we lay them out before you. God, tonight, bless every person as we give in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank amen. you for giving tonight. God bless you. Thanks to technology, it's now easier than ever to contribute when it comes to giving. Here's how. Download the Hillsong USA app on your smartphone. After opening the app, select your campus, select Give, and now you can enter the tithe amount. You can even activate the reoccurring giving options. This will allow you to give a regular preset amount automatically. You can select weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or the beginning and middle of the month, and even select the day of the week your giving is processed. 
Thank you for investing into the lives of others.
I love that song, The Blessing. It's just really powerful and speaks to the moment that we're in. And I'm going to talk about the blessing here today. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. As you can see, I have gathered with some of our pastors and staff in our Hillsong College Principal USA to share the final message in this series. We've had an outstanding day hearing from Pastor Brian. And here at The Six, I'm really glad to have these guys in the room and hopefully you'll enjoy seeing them as well. When I talk about missing you, I'm representing them as well because I know it's not just myself and Judith who misses being with you, but every single one of these pastors misses gathering with you on site as well. They didn't respond to a call to ministry. They didn't step up to a life of faith to sit in an office and to talk to people across the screen. But we're managing the season knowing that it is just a season. Well, grab your Bible and something to take notes on or click on the notes thread right there on the screen and turn with me to Psalm 134. This series is called Highs and Lows, and it's actually based on the Psalms of Ascent, which are the 15 Psalms found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. These were the songs that were sung by the tens of thousands of pilgrims who made their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish festivals each year. These songs were the soundtrack of their faith, the mixtape for the road trip, the playlist that they listened to year after year, generation after generation, as they made their pilgrimage back to their beloved city. Now, the reason they're called the Psalms of Ascent, as we've already pointed out, is because Jerusalem is high on a hill and they had to walk a steep incline to reach it. But there's something else to consider. There are 15 steps up to the temple. And to this very day, pilgrims stand and read one psalm on each of those 15 steps as they ascend to the house of the Lord, as they walk up to the temple. Now, those steps are not like the steps that we have in our homes or in our public buildings here in the Western world. I, I recently walked them in early March, just before the world changed. And again, I was reminded of the unique character of those steps. The temple steps are uneven by design. Some steps are a little wider than others. Some are a little taller than others. So you have to really slow down to climb them. They prevent you from making a hurried approach to meet with God. They force you to be mindful and intentional with every single step. And I think there's something that we can all learn from that because we all know what it's like just to make a hurried approach to God, a casual approach, a careless approach, if you will. I mean, we all know what it's like to wake up on a Sunday morning and yell, get in the car, we're gonna be late for church. We throw some clothes on the kids and we herd them out to the car and we drive as fast as we safely can, feeding a Pop-Tart over the back seat. We come screeching to a halt in the front of the church just as the service is opening. We check them into Hillsong Kids and we rush into the auditorium just in time for the third song. I'm sure nobody watching, but someone has done it at some point in the past. We all know how to do hurry. In fact, generations of church kids have had their stories of being taken to church in their pajamas with eggs in their hair or having to get dressed in the back seat of the car with your mom giving you a spit bath. We know how to do hurry. And let's be honest, gathering an online church requires even less intentionality. You don't even have to put pants on for worship today. I'm not even gonna to try to imagine what you might be wearing right now or where you might be watching from in this very moment. But if you're anything at all like me, then you probably rushed around just trying to get your device on or the TV on as the service was starting. There's nothing intentional or mindful about it. And I get it, we're busy people and we all live big lives. But what could happen in us if we took a page from the Psalms and we decided among the many things that I'm going to change in this season, I'm going to begin preparing my heart to meet with God. I'm not gonna gather on autopilot anymore. I'm not gonna just show up to be present and counted. I'm not going to engage with God 
while scrolling my Insta feed. I'm going to slow down my pace. I'm going to gather my thoughts. I'm going to open my heart. I'm going to become present to the work of the Word and the Spirit in this moment. And I'm going to say, here I am, Lord. Have your way in me. That's what it means to present yourself before God. We don't often talk about it, but that phrase is found all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. God called on His people to present themselves before Him. And we today, well, we present ourselves to God, not because He can't find us, but because we're leaning into Him. We want to show Him our heart, our desire, our willingness, our joy, our gratitude for being in His presence. Listen, if you only take one thing away from these messages on the Psalms of Ascent, let it be about the importance of presenting yourself before God. Personally, daily, corporately, and weekly. Whether that's online as it is these days or on site as it will soon be. If you present yourself before God with an open heart, God will present himself before you with his kindness, his mercy, his grace, his compassion, and his goodness. Now, that brings me to the final psalm that we're going to cover. It's the shortest one, and it won't take me much time to unpack it. Psalm 134. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Now, once again, the irony of talking about meeting in the house of the Lord is not lost on me as we gather online. But I want to speak to it directly again because we will gather on site before long. And even though God has blessed this online space, and I'm grateful for it, and we'll continue to offer an online presence for those who will need it, I'm also mindful of the fact that God has always intended for His people to gather physically in community. God wants us gathered together in the same space. Hebrews 10 and verse 24 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Notice this, not neglecting meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God says there's going to come a point in time when people will neglect the, the habit, the intentionality, the discipline, and the desire of gathering together. But don't let that be said of you. You be the people always leaning in to the corporate gathering. Now, even though the church is not a building, the church is expected to gather as a building, as a house, as a holy temple unto the Lord. You see, this journey through these songs ends with the people of God gathering in the house of the Lord. Each step has been upward and onward like climbing steps until finally they and we reach the highest destination. And now that we're there, now that we've finally gotten to Jerusalem, now that we've finally climbed the steps up to the temple and we're standing in the house of the Lord, what do we do here? The psalmist says, bless the Lord. We have gathered to bless the Lord. What does that mean? Well, in his classic book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, Eugene Peterson writes this. This sentence, come praise or bless the Lord, is an invitation. It is also a command. Having arrived at the place of worship, will we now sit around and tell stories about the trip? Having gotten to this big city, will we spend our time here as tourists, visiting the bazaars, window shopping and trading? Having gotten to Jerusalem and having it checked off of our list of things to do, will we immediately begin looking for another challenge, another holy place to visit? Will the temple be a place to socialize, receive congratulations from others on our achievements, a place to share gossip and trade stories, a place to make business contacts that will improve our prospects back home? But that is not why you made the trip. You are here 
because God blessed you, now you bless God. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I love that. You are here because God blessed you to be here. Now you bless God. And I would also add, as you bless God, He will bless you in even greater ways. Listen, you could be in a lot of places and in a lot of situations, but you're not. You're here in this moment in this place because God wanted you here. And the appropriate response is to bless God in return. Now maybe you're thinking, but yeah, Terry, I'd rather be someplace else. Me too, Maui. But, but this is where God has placed us. And this is where God desires to bless us. And when we settle into the place that God has assigned us to, we settle into a place where we can be positioned for the blessing of heaven. When you are where God places you, the blessing finds you there. Don't be someplace else where the blessing isn't. Be in the place where the blessing is going to be poured out. It is there in the place of your assignment that God releases His favor upon you. You say, but why doesn't it feel like I thought it would feel? I thought it would feel different to arrive in Jerusalem. I thought it would feel different to reach the destination I've been striving for. I thought it would feel different to be married or to be in ministry. I thought it would feel different to have a family or to be working on my dream job or to have reached some sort of another destination that I set out to accomplish in life. I, I just thought it would feel different. After walking the long winding trail filled with highs and lows, it's easy to convince yourself that every day in Jerusalem is going to be an emotional high. It's easy to expect every day in your promised land to be filled with puppies and unicorns and cotton candy. That's what we tell ourselves on the journey. When I get there, I'm never going to feel low again. When I get there, I'm never going to have another bad day. When I get there, I'm just going to be drenched in the glory of God. I'm going to live with raised chicken skin. I'm going to be in the glory cloud. I'm going to live with all of my days filled with angelic singing and heavenly moments. We, we tell ourselves those sorts of things on the journey. And then when we arrive, it doesn't quite feel like that. It, it rarely measures up to that. Maybe you didn't realize that there are going to be some highs and lows, even in the center of God's will, even in your promised land, even in the promised land. But there are. Until we stand one day in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city that God has prepared for us, there are always going to be highs and lows in our emotions, in our relationships, in our expectations, and in our experiences. But don't let the lows take you out of Jerusalem. Don't let the lows rob you of the promise. Don't let the lows rule your soul. Can I be honest? I'm preaching to myself here this morning. I'm living in this word this very week because it's so easy to let the lows set your reality and frame your expectation. We've got to simply say the lows are a part of the journey, but the highs are what frame my expectation. The highs are where my faith is attached. The highs are what I'm leaning into. The highs are what I'm believing for. The highs are what God has planned for me. God never intended for us to go from failure to failure, from brokenness to brokenness. Even though we do fail and we do experience brokenness, He wants us to set our faith on moving from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and from strength to strength. Even though there will always be some highs and lows, there's something else I promise you that will always be present, the blessing. Just as the blessing is present on the journey, it is also present at the destination. If you look carefully at Psalm 134, you'll see how the songwriter weaves the idea of the blessing all through the psalm. In fact, this psalm is drenched in the blessing so that our lives might be drenched in the blessing. There are four blessings here. 
First of all, the blessing offered from the heart of a servant. Second, the blessing offered on the night watch. Third, the blessing offered in the sanctuary. And fourth, the blessing God bestows on us in return. Now watch this. Three of those blessings ascend upward as praise, and the fourth blessing is the favor that God bestows upon us. Let me take just a minute or two unpacking each of them. First of all, we see the blessing offered from the heart of a servant. The psalmist said, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Since this is addressed to servants of the Lord, this psalm shows us that praise should be added to our work. Can you imagine a temple guard asking, well, isn't it enough that I do my job standing watch throughout the night? Well, the answer would be, no, that isn't enough. To all your work, add your praise. Bless the Lord, you servant of the Lord. I love this because it's so easy for all of us to say, haven't I just done enough already? I mean, after all, I'm here, I'm present trying to log something into the chat line, but by the time I get there, 40 other comments have come up, so I just give up. But I'm trying, I'm trying. So easy to say, you know, I, I'm, I've been faithful. And we have. But sometimes it's also easy in our faithfulness to develop an entitlement mentality. It's so easy just to allow ourselves to be ruled by expectation and disappointment when the antidote to those things is to offer praise from a heart of gratitude. Showing up is valuable, but praising up is what changes the atmosphere. There is nothing more beautiful than to see someone willingly and joyfully give themselves to building a life that pleases God and then to maintain that position in a spirit of gratitude. What the songwriter is actually saying is, hashtag, can you believe we get to do this? That's the essence of the spirit here. Can you believe that we have this privilege? It's not enough just to show up. I'm going to praise up. I'm going to bless the Lord in the midst of my work. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20 and verse 35. Second, the blessing that is offered on the night watch. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord. First Chronicles chapter nine and verse 33 tells us that now these, the singers, the heads of the father's houses of the Levites were in the chambers of the temple, free from other service for they were on duty day and night. Now it's one thing to work the day shift, but it's another thing to work the night shift. Some of you know exactly what that's like. Some of you first responders who are watching, some of you police officers, who are watching, some of you nurses and doctors and technicians, you know what that's like. Even some of you who may be construction workers. My dad worked the night shift when I was a kid. It's a tough gig. The night shift represents those who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. They're the people of the second mile, people who serve when it's dark and quiet and lonely. And maybe you're in a season like that right now. Maybe you feel like no one sees you and appreciates what you're doing. Maybe you feel like you're working alone and in the dark. The night season can also represent the dark night of the soul. And maybe that's how you feel. Maybe you're in a dark place emotionally. What do you do on the night watch? You do the same thing on the night watch as you do on the day watch. You lift your voice and bless the Lord. You lift your voice and break the silence. You lift your voice and change the atmosphere. You lift your voice and praise your God. I don't know what you're going through in this moment, but what I do know is that your praise will get you through it. You have a sufficient praise. You have a strong praise. You have a powerful praise and your praise will get you through it because God inhabits the praises of his people. When the praise goes up, the power comes down. When the praise goes up, the favor comes down. When the praise goes up, the breakthrough comes down. Psalm 42 and verse eight. By day, the Lord commanded his steadfast love and at night his song is with me, 
a prayer to the God of my life. Isaiah 30 and verse 29, I love this. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. You'll have a song in the night. You can stand on the night watch because of the power of the song in your mouth. The third thing we see here is the blessing offered in the sanctuary. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, Psalm 134, 2 says. You know, as a pastor, I love the idea of the church as a sanctuary. We don't use that old-fashioned term anymore. We call our auditoriums auditoriums. But I love the old term sanctuary because it speaks as a place of refuge, a place of safety, a haven, a harbor. And the very fact that God would describe his house in those terms also speaks of the conditions in the world around us. If the world was a safe place, we would need a refuge. If the world was kind and compassionate and committed to the well-being of all humans, we wouldn't need a safe haven. But we do. And the church as a sanctuary stands in contrast to the pandemonium and chaos in the world around us. Just think about that image for a moment, the image of a sanctuary. You may see conflict in the streets, but in the sanctuary, you should share the presence of peace. Outside, you may hear harsh and demeaning language, but inside, our language should be edifying, encouraging, and uplifting. Outside, there is gross inequality, but inside, everyone stands on equal footing. Outside, the world is frantic and life is moving at a maddening pace, but inside, the people of God are at rest, trusting God with their future. Outside, we hear the words of politicians. Inside, we hear the word of God. There's no greater contrast between the one with God's people gathered and unified as his church, juxtaposed against the scattered, divided, and dispossessed peoples of the earth. I love the church as a sanctuary. That's why I resonate with the words of Psalm 84, verse one and two. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs yet faints for the courts of the Lord. The psalmist continues in verse 10 to say, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Now, these three blessings have been the blessings that we have offered up to God. But there's a fourth blessing, and it comes down from God. Fourth, it is the blessing that God places on us in return. The psalmist says, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. I love this. I have this picture of a child standing before his father saying, I bless you, and the father saying, but I bless you. And the kid saying, but I bless you. And the father saying, but I bless you. And the kid saying, but I bless you. I, I have this picture of this competition blessing. As we bless God with our praise, God blesses us with his goodness, his grace, his kindness, and his favor. The blessing flows both ways. When we bless the Lord, the Lord blesses us. And he does that from Zion. Now, Zion represents the place of power and provision. It's the place of strength. God wants to empower you from a place of strength. He wants to provide for you from a place that is well-resourced. That's just the kind of father that he is. He wants us to live a blessed life, a grace life, a favored life, a life that reflects a relationship with him. Listen, living a blessed life doesn't mean you won't have a few lows along the journey. It means you won't walk through those lows alone. And when you walk through them, you can know that God is working all things together for your good. Now, I wanna close right here in Ephesians 1 and verse three, which remarkably has the same structure of Psalm 134. Just as the pilgrim in Psalm 134 was called to bless the Lord and in return to be blessed by the Lord, Paul says the same thing to the church. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with spiritual blessings in the heavenly place. In other words, Paul says, 
We're going to bless God because God is worthy of our praise. And as we bless Him, we are mindful of the fact that He has blessed us in Christ in the past. He is blessing us in Christ in the present, and He will bless us in Christ in the future. Christ is our Jerusalem. Christ is our holy temple. Christ is our dwelling place. Christ is the relationship where we find access to every spiritual rich. Thing that God has provided for us in His graciousness. It is all found in Christ. You clap while I breathe. <laughs> My words almost got away from me for a moment there. It was His blessing that brought us to this place. And can I just say, if we bless Him in this place, if we bless Him in this moment, He will bless us even more in the days which are to come. I know that we're in a place that none of us expected some three and a half months ago. We're in a place that none of us anticipated. But none of this has taken God by surprise. And God has made provision for us right now in these moments. In these moments, we have what we need if we stay connected to Him as the source of all supply. Let's keep ascending. Let's keep rising. Let's keep singing our way out of the darkness, praising our way into the provision that God has planned for us. Hey, just before we receive communion together, I wanna just say something important to those who may not have already begun a relationship with Jesus. Consistent blessing always flows along the line of relationship. God wants a relationship with you so he can lead you, guide you, and position you to live a blessed life. And I want that for you. Our pastors right here in the room want that for you. We want you to live a life in which nothing is missing and nothing is broken. A life that is blessed. A life at peace with God and with others. Blessing flows along the line of relationships. The way that you can access the blessing of heaven is through a relationship with a heavenly Father who loves you through the finished work of His Son, Jesus. Jesus is the way to God the Father. And would you put your trust in Jesus? He immediately brings you into a right relationship with God. And in that place of relationship, God can bless you and do in you what He longs to do. I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer that would bring you into a relationship with the God of heaven who loves you. Would you pray this with me? Let's bow your head and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus is your son. He was sent to die for me, raised to life for me, so I put my trust in him. He is my leader and Lord, and I am now a child of God. My future is secure. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to give a great big round of applause right here for everybody who prayed that prayer. If you were meeting with us on site, you would have felt the power of that applause in the room as we celebrate those who come to Jesus every single week in this online space. I want you to do one thing. If you would just click the button that says, I've raised my hand, or put a high five in the chat line, then you'll see people clapping around for you, and you'll know that we celebrate the decision that you've made. The Bible says that when just one sinner comes into a relationship with God, that all of heaven breaks out in celebration. So why don't you take a moment today so we can celebrate the beginning of a brand new life for you. And today, as always, we're going to conclude by receiving communion. So why don't you grab whatever you have near and we're going to take these symbols that represent the finished work of Jesus, the completed work, the full work in which nothing is missing, nothing is absent, but everything has been provided for. This represents his body, which was broken for us. This represents his blood, which was shed for us. And in his salvation being offered to humanity, we receive forgiveness of sins. We receive freedom from fear and torment. We receive healing in our bodies. We receive the full 
package, the full download of everything that God intends for us. Jesus didn't just pay the price to get you to heaven. He paid the price so you could live an abundant life, a full life, a flourishing life today. And these symbols remind us of that. They remind us of Jesus in our day to day, not just Jesus in our eternity, but Jesus in our day to day. So take and eat in remembrance of him. And now you can drink in remembrance of him. I'm gonna just sit here in this moment. It's late in the evening. Lord, even as we've offered you early praise this morning, Thank you for a powerful day. Thank you for a powerful message from Pastor Brian this morning. Thank you for working in the life of our church all throughout the day. Thank you that today we've seen people come to make decisions for Jesus, to follow you. Today the family has been expanded. Today people have been healed and set free from oppression and torment and addiction. Today we've seen breakthrough and blessing and favor. And here, Lord, in the final moments of the six, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for walking with us to our Jerusalem. Thank you for bringing us from far off places near to your heart. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now I want to bless you because Monday's coming at you quick. And you're going to have an opportunity to take your Sunday into your Monday. You're going to have an opportunity to live out your faith and be the difference in a darkened world. And so with that, I'm going to send you out loaded up with blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Jesus' name. God bless you, church. I can't wait to see you next weekend. It's going to be the 4th of July weekend, and I've got a special message I'm going to share with you. Have an awesome week. Go out. Change the world this week in Jesus' name. Yeah.